Whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, he is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There is a very special pilgrimage site in northern France that is just off the coast of Normandy and Brittany. It is a place where St. Michael the Archangel is greatly honored. The pilgrimage site is actually an island, a tidal island to be more exact, where the water tides, be they high or low, determine whether the site is connected to the mainland or surrounded by water. The site is simply called Mont Saint-Michel. Mont Saint-Michel is home to a monastic abbey, as well as a small number of restaurants, shops, hotels, and residences. It is one of France's most recognizable and visited places. Last year, for example, more than three million people came to visit Mont Saint-Michel. The Abbey Church, named after St. Michael, is a most impressive architectural achievement, which some have rightly called the wonder of the West. Anyone fortunate enough to be traveling through Normandy and Brittany regions of France would do well to visit this imposing rock of faith, covered with medieval buildings and topped off with that abbey church whose spire reaches high towards the heavens and has a golden statue of St. Michael at the top, for this is his island. This is his place. As the shrine of St. Michael at Mount Gargano allows the people of Italy and the southern regions of Europe to honor this great archangel, so Mont Saint-Michel allows the people in the northern regions of the continent of Europe to honor the Prince of the Heavenly Hosts. Countless people come to this island fortress that has never been conquered. They come to beg the intercession of St. Michael, the victor over Satan and the armies of darkness. Now, it's not surprising that this great monument in honor of St. Michael came about due to an apparition of the archangel to a local bishop. One night, it is said the holy bishop had a dream. St. Michael, the archangel, appeared to him commanding that he build a church in honor of the archangel on that island in his diocese. The holy bishop was quite surprised, and he was uncertain about the apparition. And so after some time, the bishop decided to ignore and reject the apparition, thinking that it was only a trick of the devil. Some days later, the archangel appeared to the bishop again, and with a severe and fiery face, St. Michael reaffirmed that it was his will that a church should be built on that island and that the bishop should obey this command without delay. But despite this second visit of the archangel, the bishop still doubted. He still doubted, and he decided not to obey the command again. And so for a third time, St. Michael appeared in a dream to the bishop and reprimanded him for his unbelief. Then St. Michael touched the bishop on the forehead with his finger. And awakening from a dream, the bishop found literally a hole, a round hole in his forehead where St. Michael had touched him. At this point, the bishop had no more doubts. He gathered his priests around him and reported what had happened. The bishop's words regarding the dream and the request that a church be built on that island in honor of St. Michael was met with great joy. The bishop soon assembled a large group of priests, religious and the faithful, and they processed over to the tidal island during low tide. The good people marched prayerfully, holding lit candles and singing holy hymns and psalms. Then they arrived at the summit of the mount and found the very spot where St. Michael wanted the church to be built. Workmen were hired, and the church building project was supervised by the bishop at every single step. But as the church neared completion, the bishop was actually embarrassed. He was embarrassed because he had no relic, no relics to place in the church for the veneration of the faithful. And so thankfully, St. Michael appeared again to the bishop and told him to send two monks to Mount Gargano in southern Italy, 
the only sanctuary in Europe consecrated to St. Michael. And from there, the bishop would obtain the desired relics. As many of you know, St. Michael the Archangel had appeared at Mount Gargano, Italy, in the year 493 A.D., leaving as a proof of his presence a purple veil, as well as a mark of his angelic feet in a stone. So a piece of that veil and a section of that stone where Michael had stood were given to the two monks who brought them back triumphantly to the bishop. St. Michael would now have two wondrous sanctuaries in his honor. The Abbey Church on Mont Saint-Michel was consecrated by the bishop with the most solemn high mass as well, being offered in honor of the Prince of the Heavenly Hosts. And after the mass, the bishop declared that he had named 12 canons for the church who would chant the divine office daily. The bishop took his own family inheritance and invested it all to maintain this work of prayer for centuries to come. And thus, the veneration of St. Michael the Archangel started and still continues to this day on that holy island. When the saintly bishop died in the year 720 A.D., his body was buried beneath the abbey church at Mont Saint-Michel. His remains were honored by the faithful for centuries until they were lost during the French Revolution when the abbey church was looted by the revolutionaries. The bishop's skull, however, was preserved and is still venerated in the local cathedral. And by the way, one can still distinguish on the relic of that skull a small hole where St. Michael had literally placed his finger. As mentioned earlier, this is a wondrous place, and it has a wondrous statue of St. Michael atop of the Abbey Church steeple at Mont Saint-Michel. The statue was first installed in the year 1897. It is made of bronze, but covered with the purest, purest gold leaf. The statue weighs more than 1,200 pounds and is 15 feet tall. The wings of the great archangel actually act as a lightning rod for the Abbey Church. And of course, the statue depicts St. Michael defeating the ancient serpent with a sword. What great honor. What great honor is given to the prince of the heavenly host. St. Michael had humbled himself before the good Lord, and as a result, he has been greatly exalted. Lucifer, on the other hand, pridefully exalted himself, and as a result, he has been greatly humbled, eternally humiliated in the lowest depths of hell in the very center of the earth. According to many church fathers, perhaps you know this too, Lucifer was, with the exception of the sacred humanity of Christ and the immaculate one who gave him flesh, Lucifer, outside of those, was the most perfect work that had come forth from the hand of God. The good Lord was the light itself, and Lucifer was the bearer of that light. The Almighty had determined from all eternity that all created persons, be they angels or men, were called to share in the wonders of heaven and supernatural happiness. But such an elevation of mere little creatures beyond their natural end would require a test, a trial. And the test for Lucifer, for Michael, and for all the angels was a humble submission to the plan of God, especially the incarnation, God becoming flesh in Mary's womb. All were to worship and honor this sacred humanity of the Son of God, as well as venerating and submitting to the mother that gave him flesh. But like Narcissus of old, who was captivated by his own beauty, and enamored by his own excellence. So Lucifer fell prey to pride in himself. The very thought that he must humble himself, most especially in the presence of Mary, made him angry. He felt insulted. 
Lucifer thought that if God were to unite himself with any one of his creatures, no creature deserved that honor more than he did. Disordered self-love and foolish pride became dominant in him, and he lost all wisdom. And the Bible says that he fell like lightning from the heavens, and he came crashing downwards towards the earth taking a third of the angels with him by his scandalous and bad example. But Michael was never one of the revolutionaries. Never. In fact, St. Michael was indignant at the outrage offered to the sovereign Lord. And true to his very name, Michael, quis ut Deus, he exclaimed, Who is like unto God? How dare anyone question, much less revolt, against the perfect plans of God? Who could possibly refuse to obey the commands of divinity itself? Michael's faithfulness, good example, and humility strengthened the good angels. And with him they stood, repeating that cry, Who is like unto God? And they fought against Lucifer. The inerrant scriptures tell us, and the good angels were victorious. They passed the test. The good Lord, therefore, unveiled before their eyes his very face. And they saw God in the beatific vision. St. Michael and the other good angels were confirmed in grace. They came to glory, and they came to know God as he knew them, and to possess the Creator. The Word made flesh became their very food and the source of their grace and glory. And because of his loyalty and humility, St. Michael was established over the princes of all the heavens. He is the prince of the heavenly host, becoming the leader of God's people and the defender of God's holy church which he has fought for and will continue to fight for until the end of time. Because Michael has been elevated, exalted above all other angels, sitting on a throne near to the very thrones of Christ the King, Mary the Queen, good St. Joseph, and the greatest of prophets, St. John the Baptist. Numberless altars and churches are consecrated to the honor of St. Michael. His very name would find its place multiple times in our sacred liturgy. And that special devotional prayer to him has been recited nearly as often as the Our Father, the Hail Mary, or the Glory Be. Finally, in one of his writings, the great Marian doctor, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, wrote, quote, of myself, I am nothing. I owe it to God if I am anything. Glory to God, therefore, for everything. Nothing is due to me, unquote. As the saints tell us, humility is truth. True humility has for its foundation the knowledge of God and of oneself. We know our place. God is all, and we are nothing. But for those who, like Michael, have a clear knowledge of their own nothingness, such knowledge makes them depend on God alone, and thus they are always preserved from any spiritual shipwreck which might overtake them. But the proud, like Lucifer, live a lie, glorifying themselves instead of their maker. And that is why God resists the proud for he will not give his glory to another. And so when we are tempted with that capital vice that is pride, let our motto be the war cry of Michael, who is like unto God. When the spirit of error rears up, causing us to think that we know better than the church fathers, the church doctors, or even the traditional magisterium, when we cling to our opinions as if they're dogma, let us humbly exclaim, who is like unto God? Are we tempted to give way to murmuring against authority and bad-mouthing authority? Let us cry out with Michael, Who is like unto God? 
Are we tempted by carnal pleasure or sensuality? Let us exclaim, who is like unto God? For only he can satisfy our deepest cravings. If we imitate Michael's humble submission to the Most High, we too shall be exalted in company with the angels and the saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.